Okay, welcome. Welcome to Script the Screen, now in its sixth season. Uh, we're actually wrapping up next month our sixth season. Uh, we're really, really happy tonight to ha bring to you The Edge of Seventeen, especially when we have the perspective of the writer-director. So let's just please welcome the writer-director of Edge of Seventeen, Kelly Freeman Craig. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting for us because we, we usually just bring the screenwriter, but it's great so we can actually run through the process, script development, pre-production, casting, and of course, production. Yeah. So let's just go back to the beginning. What, what inspired this story for you? I hadn't seen a film like it in, in, a, in a long time. You know, that just, I felt like, got the age right or, or where you just went, man, that's how it feels. That's how it feels to be that age. So. Yeah, I've done my best to suppress my high school memories, but uh, <laughs> you just brought them all back. Uh, so, but how'd you go about researching the high schooler of today? Well, was there any research process? Or? Yeah, there was. There was. I spent about um, I spent about six months like hanging out at high schools. So, <laughs> 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 which is which? It's a lot harder these days to hang out at high schools than you think. You know, there's a lot of you know because you have to explain why you're. And I'm like, no, I just. So we're like, hang out, you know? <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little, uh, you know, it's a, it, it, was, it was harder to, to accomplish than I thought. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I like sat in the back of classes. I went to a high school dance. And then um, I, uh, I sat down with a bunch of students and, and just did like hours and hours of interviews. And was just trying to make sure I was getting it right. And I wasn't just like projecting my own 90s high school experience on today. That's right. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about, of course, your lead character, Nadine. She's dramatic, tough, vulnerable, funny, can break your heart the next moment. What were the challenges in crafting the character in the script stage? Um, you know, I, I really was just, was just always trying to get to the truth of who she was and, and, and kind of warts and all, you know, just really showing her in every, every facet that was true to her, whether you liked it or not, you know what I mean? Even when it was ugly. And so, um, so I, I guess the challenge was just keeping, keeping us on her side, even when she pushes the limit and she's, she's an asshole sometimes and she's, you know, she makes choices that you're like, oh, why would you do that? But then, uh, but then on some level, I think, you know, I, I hope that you see underneath the pain that those choices are coming from. You know what I mean? So trying to just, I guess, really just trying to craft her as truthfully as I could. And that's another thing, the tonal thing, because was there ever, when the early draft was, did you worry about the comedy versus the darkness? Like one would weigh the other down or? Um, you know, I just, I, I just always knew that, um, that the thing, I, the thing that we were all serving was, is it real? Is it real? And that, and that was always the barometer in terms of the comedy too, you know? I mean, because there's a lot of times where we'd try things and we'd, we'd push the, we'd push the comedy broader and, and maybe it would be, um, it might be funny, but you can only go so broad before you've lost all credibility in terms of your your more dramatic moments. So, so balancing that was, was something that was just always in the back of my mind. So did you think drama first? Like, I just want to get the dramatic story first and then the comedy No, of that? No, I mean, I'm definitely, like, I, uh, for, me, for me as a person, like, I like to explore dark, painful things through comedy. So for me, it's almost, it's, they're all wrapped, it's all wrapped up together. You know what I mean? It's, so then let's talk about the, uh, the, mo the, the casting. Uh, Haley Steinfeld. What yeah. was it about her that you saw that you didn't see in any of the other actresses? Um, that, the casting was the most insane part of the, of the whole process. Um, because um, I, I saw, I myself saw over a thousand girls audition for the role. And... Um, and there was just, you know, they would come in and they just, it, it was so hard to get somebody who, who knew how to nail the comedic timing, um, but then could also, in the next moment, really break your heart, you know, um, where you could see this vulnerability coming through. 
And, and, and also, you know, she had to be somebody that, that even when she's, even when she's being a jerk, you, you, you can still root for her. You can still love her because you see this, like this vulnerability right underneath the surface, you know? Um, and that was just so hard to find in an, in an actress and especially that young, you know? Um, and I will say like, I think comedic timing is so underrated in terms of acting. It's so hard to find. Um, so, you know, finding somebody who had that and had the dramatic chops was a... So maybe some of them did have one or the other. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, they just couldn't find yeah both. exactly, yep. Uh, that was, that was all, uh, the case a thousand times until she walked into the door. Uh, and then when you saw her first audition, you knew that was, it was it? Yeah, it was like the skies opened up. And I, I was so relieved, too, because I had spent so, you know, I'd spent a year seeing it not right and thinking, I don't think we can make the movie because we just can't find her. And uh, I mean, I really thought, I don't think we're going to make the movie. So, and then she walked in. So, um, all right, so curious, did, uh, so before we, we shoot, did she have any notes, ideas, what, you know, did she bring anything that surprised you to the character that you didn't originally vision? You know, um, I, she just, I mean, the thing that's so amazing about Haley is she just, she finds all sorts of little moments inside, in, you know, like between the lines. It's just a look or an aside or something, you know, it's just, it was those little moments where y you're just watching somebody who's just a great, great actor who's just alive in every moment and doesn't, you know, uh, their eyes are always, there's fire behind them, you know? Did that free you up a little where you knew that she could d deliver an emotion sometimes without even dialogue? Did that kind oh, of be Oh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, th I really, like, really having seen every actress this age, like, I think she's the actress of her generation. She's, like, really that good. All right, so what was the, re what was the process of pre-production? Did you have time for rehearsal with the actors, or did you, what was the process before you actually got to the shoot? Uh, I did, I, um, I, I did have a time for a little bit of rehearsal, but I don't like to do a lot of it. I, you know, I, I, I found that, I found that when I would do it, it's, it becomes a little stale, and, and one of the great things about working with great actors is, um, is when you, you know, you give them the scene, and you, you sort of give them the general blocking, but you don't, I, I try not to say more than that because you don't know what they're gonna bring to the, the moment. And, and the greatest thing is when you haven't said anything and then they do something that you go, holy that's so much better. And you know, so, so I, never wanna, um, I never want to step on that moment, you know? So, so I, ended up, I ended up really not doing a lot of rehearsal. And it made it easier since not only you have Haley, you have Woody Harrelson, yeah. Uh, yeah, Haley, but she had a really great cast. Uh, we talked a little backstage. What were some challenges of getting Woody to set? Because a lot of the aspiring directors don't fully understand out in the audience what uh -huh. it sometimes is difficult to get actors, you yeah. know, with production problems or other movies, just oh. the challenges of getting them to well, fit them into your schedule. Yeah, well, this was, I mean, it was just crazy because, um, I mean, man, I, I, I don't know how this guy... I don't know how he does it, but he is just, he's like, I mean, he does like seven movies in a year or something crazy. So he literally came off of LBJ the next morning, like finished, wrapped that night, the next morning got on a plane to come to us. And then we, and, and he was at the same time filming Planet of the Apes. So we had to carve out six days here and there and he would have to like, you know, give up some of his weekends on Planet of the Apes for us. And he was really generous. And we, I mean, we had to, like negotiate with a bond company who like they have they take out insurance on actors and like they ha they have to have some padding so the fact that he was going straight from LBJ into our movie was a whole ordeal i mean it was it was a nightmare it was crazy it was and he, the skin of our teeth and he never him. slipped into LBJ during your movie I you know. said no you got too much <laughs> Lyndon Bage Johnson i need you to play the teacher more yeah, <laughs> yeah. the uh, now usually the writer and director are not the same uh, in movies, it's actually pretty fortunate. You, you know, good, wonderful that you had the opportunity. Uh, and there's always a war with notes between the director and writer. Mm -hmm. Did you have a war with yourself, or you're able to have a switch in your brain where you can just switch between roles, or they just meld together? You know, I, um, I, th it, once you're on set, it's like you're the director part of you is king. You know what I mean? And if and if you're watching something that's not working, 
what you wrote is not working, it's you have to throw it out and start and find a new way, you know. Um, and you sort of can't be precious about it if it's not if something's not coming together and, and you're up against the clock, you've got to find another way to um, another way to make it work. Um, um, I, you know, one of the things that Jim Brooks, who produced the film, uh, told me, which I think was so great, he said, you know, and he's, he's a writer-director, and he says, you know, get what the writer intended. Always get that. Just serve that part of you once, you know, but then, then feel free to throw it away, but do it once. So I tried to do that, too. Oh, so he sort of, he mentored you on this a little? The, uh, yeah, oh, you know? yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, so also one other thing is, is from the writer director point of view, if you're in intricately involved with this script for so long in this story, it must make it slightly easier for you on set making directorial decisions. What she wears, what she because it isn't as kind of naturally like, oh she would wear this. I, I re yeah, I really think so. I think so. I think I think when you've spent that long with these people, they start to feel weirdly like family to you, you know? And uh, and you know, yeah, you do know. You do know, well of course I'd wear the blue shirt. Of course, I'd wear these shoes. Like you, you know the answers to the questions. Yeah. And when did you know that the jacket was right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, uh, that was one that that we worked really hard on, and I knew that I wanted her to have like a signature piece of clothing that you that you would look at and you'd be like, oh, like that's <laughs> that's not good. And then after a while, you'd be like, is it good? Maybe it is kind of good. It's kind of cool. You know, um, and so and trying to find that that hit that bullseye was tough. And so I um, I was just like Google imaging stuff for a long time, and then I found this little picture of this little jacket, this little '70s ski jacket, and um, and I showed it to my costumer, and she looked everywhere trying to find that, and it couldn't find it anywhere, and it ended up making it off of this little little picture. So uh, let's talk a little, we'll talk a couple of scenes. I was curious about uh, obviously your opening scene. Mm -hmm. You have them trading suicide notes. Because yes. <laughs> uh, normally we don't expect teachers to go in that direction. Uh, yeah. Did you always want to open with that? Did you always know that was the, your, your start of the film? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. When I sat down to, to write it, um, I, that was the, the, the first scene that I wrote, and I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know who she was. All, like, I just started to kind of hear a voice and she walked in and she said that. I didn't know why she was going to kill herself. I just know she, she was. And then I thought, well, what does he say? And then, and then all of a sudden I had him, you know, him reading his own suicide note back and I, I had no idea who he was. But by the end of the scene, I did, which is, which is I think the amazing thing about writing is, is it's re the, the, the most magical moment is when suddenly it starts telling you what it wants to be. You know what I mean? Because so much of writing is you going, okay, I have this idea, how do I put it into this little, how do I make this work? And then sometimes it's the opposite. All of a sudden it's just like, it's telling you, I, I want to be this character and say this, you know? And that's really cool. And what was Woody's reaction to the, that dialogue when he first read it, do you remember? Um, you know, I mean, he, he, he was just, it, it, I mean, you, you saw it. He was just, he was all, he was amazing. He was deadpan and cool, and, and, but hilarious, and yeah. Well, the other thing was interesting, because you had also <laughs> set up the relation, best friend relationship, but you didn't also have a lot of screen time for mm -hmm. that. Yeah, what were the that challenges of that? Because that sequence really did establish their bond, which you needed, but how did you wrestle with that? Or was there that, was a that was actually, it's interesting you bring that up. That was really tricky. And what's, what is, you know, the, the way a lot of that got set up is actually when I cast the um, Krista, Haley Lou Richardson, um, when I was just like uh, searching, searching about her on the internet to kind of get, her no get to know her as an actress, I found this random YouTube thing that she made with her best friend where it's just the two of them goofing around and putting on stupid costumes and makeup and it's just, and it's hilarious. It was so good and it was her and her best friend and I thought, and I immediately like loved their friendship. Like I rooted for them as friends. And so it was, I mean, we cast her like a week before we went into production. So th right then I went, I've got to put something like that in the film. And so we ended up when we, we there was always that sort of drunken montage but um, but I added uh, filming it on you know filming it on an iPhone and everything and kind of making it feel like it was something they were filming because of that. 
Interesting. Um, you also create a very humorous portrait of the dysfunctional family and then take it away with the death scene with the father. And each family member is affected, really the springboard for the movie. How do you approach that scene knowing that was the catalyst for really all the characters, even though only Haley and the dad were in the scene together? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of that was, a, a lot of that, I just, I knew that, I knew that I needed to establish a real connection between the two of those characters so that you would care when he died, you know? And he was also another character that there's very little screen time. Um, so I knew that I had to get as much bang for my buck as I could. Um, so really a lot of it was actually all the stuff that happened before, you know, when she's a little girl and, and the conversation they have in the car before and they're, they're kidding around as he's singing. And it was all that stuff before that had to really, you had to feel it in order to care of it and understand why, why his loss would would be so devastating to her. It was also interesting because we didn't see the brother with him as much, which really did set up the end very well when you <laughs> realize he was just as devastated. Yeah. Now that yeah. was clever. Uh, but speaking of trauma, and you know, I hate to ask this question, but I have to. Mm -hmm. What did Billy Joel do to you that made you want to associate his music <laughs> with death? <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, originally, originally written in the script, it's um, it was I wrote. Tom Jones, it's not unusual, it's not unusual <laughs> to be low. Um, and we couldn't get the rights. It was like it was like five hundred thousand dollars or whatever to use the okay. song. It was like you know a big fraction of our budget. We couldn't do it, and so I, I searched and searched and searched to try to find a song that would work, um, because I just I knew it couldn't be. I knew he couldn't be singing like a love song to his daughter because it'd just be too much. That if he died during that, you know. And I, I knew it had to be of his generation. I knew I wanted it to be up and, you know, a guy he'd admire and listen to. And then found that song and I thought, I mean, really, I'd listened to hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of songs trying to find the right thing. And, uh, and when I found that, I thought, if we can't afford this, I don't, know, I don't know what we'll do. And somehow, by the skin of our teeth and again, like negotiating and calling in favors and whatever, we, we ended up, he ended up, ended up giving us the song, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, let's talk a little about Erwin. He embodies teenage awkwardness to a T. I can <laughs> certainly remember being that way. Uh, how do you how do you work with the actor? Because he's instantly likable, mm -hmm. insecure teenager, but also had to be strong enough to push back on Nadine a little, especially like in the pool scene. Yeah. What was the process working with him? Uh, well, Hayden Zito is first of all. He was the first guy we cast, and I was sure that we were going to have to look forever for that part. I just didn't, you know, I. Um, but he ended up being like the uh, third guy that walked into audition and he, he was just it before we cast Haley or Woody or anybody. And um, he was just, he just is so instantly likable. He's just, and he also, he, he's an incredible improviser. So uh, particularly with him, I would, you know, I'd get the scene and then I'd be like, play, have fun, try stuff, like, you know, throw stuff in there. Let's see, let's see. Um, his whole thing where he uh, where he leans off the Ferris wheel and says, "Can you stop the <laughs> ride?" That's him. That's an improv. He was he was just sick of being on the Ferris wheel because I had him going around like sixty times. So, <laughs> um, so um, so yeah. Um, he was just. I mean, the guy is. It, it was his first movie. He was, you know, his first movie he really ever did, and he was so nervous showing up to set. And then he, the cameras would roll, and he'd just be, he'd just be like, "Yeah, I, I love the awkward kiss moment. Yes, that that yeah. was my favorite moment. <laughs> but I also, again, normally, you know, that would the scene would have ended in that movie. I liked that you went back to it, but they actually moved to a different place. Yeah, yeah, they uh -huh. found their way. So yeah. that was, uh, so was that in the script, the awkward kiss, or yes, you know, yes, yes, was. yeah. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Yeah, one of the most difficult scenes was Nadine's long speech about, mm -hmm. you know, not relating to the youth. What, what challenge is that as a director when someone has to give a long speech and then Woody had to react to it? Mm -hmm. What was that kind of like on set working that through? First of all, like Woody and Haley together, it was, it was so easy to work with them. They were both so, I mean, it was, there was just this electricity that came out whenever the two of them were together. You could tell they were having fun together. You know, they liked each other as sparring partners. And... Um, and so it was just honestly like they they just had this i don't know this back and forth thing where you could just let them go and give them a sense of if i gave her a sense of what she wanted which is 
which is I was like, you're just you're trying to impress him. You're trying to be like you and me, man. You know, we're 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 alike. All those other idiots out there, you know, they don't understand us. Um, and then him kind of pulling the rug out from under her. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, they're, they're such incredible actors that you could just give them a sense of here's what you're trying to accomplish in the scene. Here's what you want. Here's how you want to affect the other person, and and then you know just let them go. I really enjoy his moment when he's pencil sharpening, trying to drown her out. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that was such a cute little you know because you know, he had to do something. He didn't want to say shut up. Yes, yeah, exactly. You know. I'm so <laughs> glad you say you say that because that was a moment that when so when we were doing our test audience so i love the pencil sharpener and that's actually that's a woody improv yeah. that was something he did on set while we were in rehearsal and the whole crew cracked up <laughs> it was so funny and so i was like okay we have to keep that in there and um and then when in test audiences they you know he'd do it and we, we couldn't tell if people were laughing. And we had this big argument whether, whether they were laughing and we just couldn't hear it because the pencil sharpener was drowning them out. <laughs> or, you know, so in the editing room, we were constantly, and then we, we finally like got a video to, of, the, of the audience, of the test audience, to see if they laughed at that part. <laughs> But we still, we st we're all like staring at this little like, you know, very blurry video of the audience and we still couldn't tell. And finally we went, ah, I can just leave it in, you know? <laughs> so I'm so glad you mentioned it. You liked it. I love it. That <laughs> and, it's, uh, and that's also part of it when the actor knows what his character is, it allows them a little more freedom. Oh, to yeah. To find another way, because he did have to find a way to, you know, he cut so her knew that He so knew that guy, yes, it was amazing. Uh, no, but now we switch to some tragic moment. Now, mm -hmm. Woody says har some horrible things. Maybe no one likes you. Yeah. And he gets away with it. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the line that devastated her the most was, Mom, your dad would be so disappointed how you turned out. Mm -hmm. uh, when crafting that complex relationship, how did you work with a mother-daughter relationship? Because that scene to me was the painful scene for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was, you know, that was, that was tough. That was tough. Um, that was a scene we, we shot and then we actually reshot again because it because knowing it was so it was so critical and it had to be something that like that wounded her enough to send her out the door and send her you know off to send this insane text and everything um, and originally originally in the script she she said something that was just a little it, it didn't cut as deep and so when I saw the dailies I went I just can't I, I don't understand why she walks out the door. And so I rewrote it and I wrote that line and then we reshot it. And it was um, and it was it it was the thing that that you know you could understand how she could spiral from it. Yeah, and then actually that leads of course to the different form of love, the sexting scene. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the choice of having Woody read the text? <laughs> because as as an older guy, that's the scene that creeped me out having him read it. <laughs> like, you know, and his reaction to it. I just, I mean, to me, that's my, fa I, that's my favorite scene in the movie. Um, it's, I still can't, I, I just, every time he gets to, like, he gets to the dirty words, the way his <laughs> face changes is so funny to me that I can't, I laugh every time. Um, but I just, it was so, so painfully uncomfortable. I, just as I was writing it, I liked how uncomfortable it made me, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. And it, uh, it didn't make Woody uncomfortable, or was he just, oh, he just rolling no. with it? And just <laughs> like, uh, now, sex scenes are very difficult. Uh -huh. uh, but this scene with Nick and Nadine was in a, you were in a small car, deals with serious <laughs> subject matter and bordering on rape. Mm -hmm. How did you show, shoot this complex uh, scene? Because you didn't have a lot of room, you didn't have, what was that process? Um, yeah, um, you know, it was just really, you know, really having frank conversations with both actors beforehand and, you know, explaining to them what happens and, and really just trying to be as frank about the whole thing as possible. Like, especially when it comes to a scene like that, like if you're tiptoeing or you're awkward, then it just makes the whole thing awkward. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think they really understood where, where they were coming from. And, um, and, I, and I think that, like, I, I think that, I think the, the great thing about um, Alex Calvert, the guy, the, the guy, is I think you get where he's coming from. You, you get that he's like, what? Like, this is, it's sort of unfair for him, too. You know, he really, he was sent a very clear message about what was supposed to happen. What I really liked is we see Nadine mature before our eyes. 
uh, because at the end she sees her, Mr. Bruno and her brother in a different way than she originally envisioned them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in the script, it was interesting because she's been talking. She always talks, but she's silent. Mm-hmm. How did you approach those? Because both of those moments with Mr. Bruno and especially her brother saying, you know, mm-hmm. how did that go? Because that was, Haley was pulling back a lot, which, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how'd you work with them on that one? Um, yeah, that was, that was, it was important for, um, for her character to start, you know, she said she runs her mouth all the time and sort of a know-it-all and, um, and to have her s- realize that she doesn't know everything. You know, she thinks she has the world wired and she knows everything about everybody. And, and, um, and I think that her recognizing that the, that the world is a lot different than she thinks, that people are a lot more than whatever they present on the surface, you know? It, she needed to sort of take that in and stop talking. That's interesting, because you, you referenced John Hughes movies, which I grew up and adored, mm-hmm. but one of the problems with some of the high school movies was there's always the brother's the villain, mm-hmm. the parents are the villain, but you'd seen this movie wanted to make sure all the characters were real. Yeah. Even though she didn't perceive him that way till the end. Yeah. Was it a conscious uh-huh. choice where you just want to make sure they're all kind of... Yeah, I mean, that was, really, that was really what, you know, the message of the movie was, that you can... I mean, the whole thing, the whole reason I, I started to write it and what I was trying to explore is, I think, that idea where you... That feeling... Um, where you feel like you're the only person in the world who's messed up and everybody else is fine, you know? And how lonely that is and how painful and how I think sp- particularly at that age, how you can really feel that that's the truth. Um, and, then, and then you start to realize like everybody, everybody in the world is, you know, is carrying some sort of pain. You know, everybody's been through something tough regardless of how they present, you know? Now, the mom resolution I found interesting. Did you struggle with that? Because it was a text, but it was subtle. Mm-hmm. Did, you have, did you always know you wanted to go that way, or that was kind of how do you resolve that relationship? Did you wonder? I, yeah, I knew, um, I knew I wanted to resolve that relationship in a way that didn't feel like it, was, like it had a total bow on it, but it felt like it was a step towards, step towards them trying to acknowledge the other person, you know, her... Nadine acknowledging the fact that her mom is just worried about her and needs to know she's safe and her, you know, the mom acknowledging that she's got to let go, that she can't control everything, you know. Um, and also, did you always know you were going to end on Erwin and Nadine? Was that always kind of, you landed on that? I did, yes, yeah. But that, but the ending where we go and, and push in on Nadine and, and that la- her last look is something that I reshot, particularly just to get that that shot of her. Now, what about the animated movie? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was, you, was that always the animated? You always wanted that from the beginning? Yes, yeah. Because yeah, I did feel like a student, that was a perfect student animation film, which my colleague talked about <laughs> earlier before. Uh, so, so, yeah. that, and so did you wrote that from the beginning, though? Mm-hmm. You that? Yep, yeah, uh, yeah. All right, so what about, you know, you had a great look to the film, costumes, stuff like that. What was the process mm-hmm. of working with the co- costume designer, production designers? How did that uh, process develop for you? Yeah, um, uh, uh, the costumes were a blood sport. I mean, it was like <laughs> it was really it was really tough because um, because I especially for Nadine because I knew that I wanted her to not fit into any. I didn't I didn't want you to be able to look at her and be like she's a this you know and fit her into some group that you know of. Um, so trying to find something that was sort of like originally her. Um, and that felt like it was somewhere between, oh, that's awful, and that's kind of cool, you know? Trying to find that was, I mean, we had marathon costuming sessions, trying to find, I mean, had to bring in, like, doubles to, like, just try, just try on costumes, just to see stuff together, and the socks and the shoes and the whole, it was, it was madness. Um, so looking back, I mean, we talked about the strong relationships. You, know, you have strong relationships with all the characters. Uh, and we do have a lot of aspiring screenwriters, correct? Do we? In the audience? Yay. <laughs> uh, so what advice could you give the students when crafting characters, especially the minor characters that are also not featured in a script? You know, um, one, of the, one, of the best, one of the best things to do is to look at every character and ask yourself what what would the movie be if this was their movie 
you know, where you really write the movie from their perspective, and then suddenly it gives them a, a POV, you know? Um, what do they want? Um, a lot of times, I think, particularly when writing those peripheral characters, it's easy to just think about whatever, whatever you're trying to accomplish with your main character, these, these people are helping you with it. But, um, but if you really think about them as the hero of the story, then all of a sudden they become more complicated. Um, and I think also, you know, the other thing that I always, I always think of when I write characters is that people are, people are so complicated and they're full of contradictions. You know, they're, um, they're, they can be strong and arrogant and then just wildly insecure. And seeing both of those things together, I think, is what makes you recognize, oh, that's, a, that's real, that's a real person, you know? Um, I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, adding dimensions. Interesting. Well, well, we do have some students in the audience, so if you like, we have time for a couple of audience questions. Um, you spent so much time with these characters, and for me, like as a writer, after I spend like four months, I'm just like, oh, guys, get it together. <laughs> like, how do you spend so much time without like hating these characters? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? The the truth is, like, I think any 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 creative endeavor, you're going to hate it at some point. Like, you you are. I mean, you spend so much time with it. And you not only hate it, you hate yourself for creating it. Like, I mean, it's just, it's torture. Um, but I think if there's that kernel of, of, that kernel of the idea that you, that you can really feel into, um, for me, it was that exploring that loneliness, you know? If, if I could just find my way back to that feeling, I could stop hating everything, you know what I mean? Um, and I think the other thing is, like, it's a lot of times it's about getting fresh eyes. It's very hard when you've spent a lot of time in a script or then, you know, when you're shooting and you're editing, blah, blah, blah. you spent so much time that you can't feel it anymore. Um, and so there's all these, like, tricks you have to do to just go empty your mind and take a walk and, blah, 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 and just try to, like, get clear and walk in as a new person experiencing it. Um, and so I find that so much of the process is actually like it's so it's so sentient, it's so feeling, it's so like opening yourself up to feel like what is this making me feel? And you constantly have to be in a place that you can do that, you know. And we got your next. Hi, wonderful film. Thank you. Um, now you've gotten a number of awards for this being for first time filmmaker type of awards, but clearly you've been writing for a long time, I would have to assume. It's kind of like that overnight success concept. Right. So how long have you been writing? What kind of things have you been writing before? Um, what kind of um, directing had you done before? I'd love to know about some of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I started writing my senior year in college. I'm 36 now, so when I was 22, 21, 22, I started writing, started writing screenplays. And, um, and yeah, and really um, did a lot, of, a lot of things where I rewrote scripts and, you know, and um, adapted things or, you know, wrote a television pilot and that sort of thing um, for a lot of years. Um, and in terms of you know, in terms of directing, I really had less. I had I had much less experience. Um, I um, I had been making little movies since I was like twelve. I would I would make little like music videos with my friends, and you know, um, I recreated the Wild Night video, um, uh, and uh, and just like I, I mean, just like little things here and there, but it was always like play. I never thought I would actually be able to make a career out of it. And then, you know, and then I started, um, I started writing and, uh, and I had, I had my first film produced and when, and then, and somebody else directed it. And when I went through that experience, I saw so clearly that, um, that, particularly in movies, it's a director's medium. And I saw how y you have one thing and then, you know, and then you hand it off and you have no idea what's going to come out. You have no, I mean, it's just, it's, um, it's, it's all in the execution. 
And so that made me go, I, I gotta find a way to get behind the camera. Um, and then I just, you know, the great thing about, um, about writing and, and those of you in here who are writers is if, if, if the material, if people like the material and you control it, then you have a much more of an opportunity to say, and, and I'd like to direct it. And people can look at you like you're crazy, but you control the material, you know? And that's, I think, the wonderful thing about being, about being a writer. Um, and also just the fact that nobody has to give you permission to do it. You know, every other job in this industry, like, you know, 50 people have to say, okay, you can act in that or whatever, you know, or you can, you know, or we'll, whatever. There's so many different things that have to line up, but writing you can do anytime, anywhere, and yeah. Um, something I enjoyed a lot about the film was like the really quick um, punch lines and like the one in particular that like kind of really caught me off guard was the when they when it was like the little girls and they were they pushed her and they were like I hope you get AIDS <laughs> and that like I laughed at that for just like so long when I first saw this this is my like fourth time seeing this movie because I just like it's so funny I show all my friends um, and um, I was just wondering I know you mentioned like audience reactions and like when I write I kind of like will look at something and I'll be like, oh, I think this is hilarious personally. So uh -huh. like, did you test this line or did you just like go for it? <laughs> um, yeah, n I mean, well, when you're writing the script, you don't, you know, you don't know. You're just like, you know, you're just really going off of exactly that. Like, to me, this is funny, you know? Um, and then, you know, and the same thing, the same thing happens on set. You don't, you know, you don't know uh, because it's not like, not like you're getting laughs, you know, because everybody's got to be quiet. So you. Um, you uh, then you you put it in the put it in the theaters and you see where people laugh and um, and sometimes sometimes the things that you're totally you're like positive or hilarious aren't <laughs> and uh, and sometimes you know sometimes you're right so yeah hi um, I just want to say first like I love this movie and <laughs> you did a fabulous job and if. I oh, love it. Thank so, you. Um, but I was wondering, as a writer, one of the problems I deal with most of the time is dealing with endings that are very cliche and mm. overdone. And did you have any problems when you were originally starting to write the script, and, like especially with the ending and trying mm -hmm. to resolve all the conflicts that you have? And mm -hmm. if so, like what did you do to solve this? Yeah, that's a you know that's that's. Um, it's a great thing that you mentioned because that is, it's such a difficult thing because essentially you want the story to end in a way that's satisfying, but that's not where every last thing is wrapped in a perfect bow where it's unrealistic, you know, and, and that's a th real needle to thread. Um, and it's tough. And I mean, you know, uh, trying to like trying to, repair the, the the friendship between the girls was a was a real threading of a needle um, and, a, and a scene that I went back to shoot um, just to get uh, Krista to say to Nadine can I call you because that that wasn't there initially because again I didn't want I, I didn't want it to be too wrapped up but then I found that it wasn't quite wrapped up enough but I didn't want to be like hey we're best friends again you know so it was very 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 delicate in fact that I will say is I think the part of any film that um, that it's righteous for it to drive you crazy it should it should you're doing it right if you're if you're questioning constantly whether it's too much or too little that's that's the whole that's the hardest part of the whole thing. So it should be hard. Well, we always end our show with the same question. Okay. Uh, so can you tell us about a, a, a special movie theater experience you had, perhaps as a child, going with the movies with your family? Something a movie that maybe inspired you? Oh man, um, the first thing that came to my mind um, was actually going to the drive-in, which I, which we don't really have anymore. Does we actually have one in town. Really? In Santa Barbara, yeah. Okay, yeah, there's, there's like none in LA anymore. But I remember going to the drive-in and watching Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. <laughs> 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 which, um, which at the time as a kid, like with my sleeping bag and watching this like very 
big, large, you know, watching them like little tiny people and big giant grasshoppers and stuff. I was like, this is so cool. It's just, I don't know, blown away by the whole experience. <laughs> Edge of 17 shows us that being 17 is more than awkward encounters or throwing up in toilets. Often we forget that we all went through that and we did make it out alive. So I do want to thank Amen. you for coming with us, sharing your insight, and inspiring our next generation of writer-directors. Thank you, thank you so, so much. much. Thank you.